Hey y'all, here's a lesson on James Brown funk rhythms. I was a guitar player in his band from 1999 to 2006. I played about 400 shows across the world with James Brown, so I'm going to show you guys the stuff that we did on stage and some of the most famous songs, and I'm going to go into more in depth into further lessons later on, but this is going to be kind of a quick, fun one. I'm going to do the songs Make It Funky and Hot Pants, maybe one or two more. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is Make It Funky. Now, Make It Funky is going to use this D7-9 chord. So that's like a D note here, 5th fret of the 5th string. First finger on that 4th fret of the D string, the 4th string. And then we have this 3rd finger that bars all 3 of those bottom strings on the 5th fret. So it ends up being 5-4-5-5-5. Five, 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 five. So that is kind of the James Brown funk chord, the D7-9. You can call it D9 for short. Uh, in the jazz and funk world, people normally know what you're talking about. If you're talking about a D major 9, you would have to say that. That would kind of make it another thing. But the 7 chord is very common in blues and funk and stuff, so it's just kind of known that that's what you're talking about if you say 9 chord. Now, the Jimi Hendrix chord, what I refer to as the Jimi Hendrix chord, is like the raised 9. So if we were to look at the scale... To explain the nines, what those numbers mean, those numbers always just mean the note in the scale, like the interval of the scale is added to the chord. So if we looked at the D major scale, well, by that point, we've played eight notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, the next note of the scale would be that note. So if you notice, that note right there on that second string, that is part of this chord now. A normal seven chord, dominant seven chord, would be like five, four, five, three. But this one is five, four, five, five, and then another five on the bottom. So that's why it's called a nine, is because we added the ninth note of the scale to the chord. It's part of that chord now. So that is like the James Brown funk chord. So we're gonna get funky with that one. And the rhythm on this one is, is real cool. Um, it's gonna be like, There's a few things going on there. So the first thing is these are, think of 16th notes over this whole measure. 1 E and a, 2 E and a, 3 E and a, 4 E and a. All of these strums fit into one measure of four sets of 16th notes for each beat. So that was 16 different things happening. So for each beat, there's four things happening. 1 E and a, 1 E and a, 2 E. It's kind of like that kind of counting. It's kind of hard to do it and say it at the same time. But um, what we got is... So our first beat is one E and uh. What I'm doing there is I'm doing a staccato chord. So I'm making that chord stop as soon as I hit it with my left hand. Just by releasing the pressure off of those... I'm not coming off the string, but I'm just taking the pressure off of holding those notes. And that makes the chord stop. And if you keep your fingers on the string, then you don't have any noise or anything. And you can make those chords stop at will, however you want, you know, whatever you want. So the first thing, the first beat we're doing is one E and a. Uh. And what I'm doing is I'm holding my fingers. All my fingers are touching strings, so there's not going to be any note noise when I'm doing those second and third things. So it's like one E and a. Uh. So that was a down stroke and then a up and down with chicks without the chord. So the first down stroke had the chord. The next two, the up and the down, have muted notes. And then the last up of that beat was another chord. So it's like one E and uh. So let's look at how the second beat works out. So it ends up being a thing where you're like chord, chick, chick, chord, chick, chick, chord, chick, chick, chord, chick, chick, chord, 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 chick. Okay, so that's the whole pattern. So if you think about it that way, it's weird because you're going back and forth, and sometimes the one that you hit is not the same, you know, it's not a down or an up like it was before. It shifts around, but that's what make it, makes it kind of extra cool, you know, extra funky. So we got... So let's talk that through one more time. We're going to have chord, chick, chick, chord, chick, chick, chord, chick, chick, chord, chick, chick, chord, 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 chick.
Okay? And that's going to be actually the same rhythm for the song Hot Pants. Now, Hot Pants, I think they had, they did that one in E flat. And a lot of um, a lot of James Brown songs, they actually recorded in D, and they changed, they raised the pitch to make it sound like it's in this higher key. They really played it over here, but it sounds like this. So all this, the vocal notes and the solos and everything have all been jacked up to another pitch by by in the machine, you know. So that's kind of why James Brown sort of sounds like Alvin and the Chipmunks a little bit sometimes, but. Um, they just decided that it made the song sound more lively and more just more exciting or something, you know. So let's look at hot pants. Let's let's do the exact same rhythm because we're gonna be in E flat this time. So we got six five six six six. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to get a loop going and I'm going to show you this other riff. Now that could be like um, the later live version where it adds a little bit to it. Um, things kind of develop over the years and get, you know, little fancy things get added to it. The original might have been more like. Without that extra thing. So the other one was. So what we're doing there is we're doing 11 to 13 hammer-on on the D string. And then we're doing the second and third strings. We're going to bar those two on the 11th fret. And then we're going. Same thing, but back to that 13th fret of the D string. So. And that one was that hammer-on. Then the 13s down here on the second and third string to the 11s on the second and third string, so. So let's get that loop going and I'll be right back. We'll check it out. Okay, so there's the loop of that rhythm part down here in the sixth fret. This would be an E flat seven nine. Now I'm gonna bring in that other riff here. like the original version. Now here would be the more souped up later version. So now there's something else fun. There's a riff here that we can add. The recording of this was in E flat because they raised that pitch thing. And then they go to a riff off of C, that C note, third fret, A string. That kind of thing. So what's interesting is when we were playing this live, we played it in D, like they originally cut the record before they changed up the pitch thing. And we would do the riff in D as well. So it's it's interesting that you your the studio recording is like E flat for its basic um, key. But then when it goes to the riff, it goes down three frets or a step and a half to get to the C riff. <laughs> Which gives it some, you know, it makes it a little bit more interesting. Now we would do it like on the fifth fret, and when we do the riff, we go same key. Et 
etc. So let's take a look at that riff there. We got three to two. We're gonna go back to that E flat one. So we're gonna have three, two, three, four. So that three was on the fifth string, two was on the fourth string. So part of a like C, C triad. So watch that. So that's a tricky one. Bum, 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 bum. Five, three, five, and that three is on the lower. Five, three, five, three, six, three. So. So it's down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down. So it's one of those things where you're trying to keep your down and up picking very meticulous to keep the feel of everything right. So. And, and the downs and ups are dictated by where that those notes are within those 16th notes. You know, it's all about keeping a steady, like when you're strumming, you're picking stuff, you have like inside yourself, you're feeling this down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, like all the time. And you're just playing wherever the notes might be, that's where the, the stroke is. It's like, if the note is on a down beat, if it's on the one, think about like a one E and a, if it's on the one or the a, uh, then it's a down. But if it's on an E or an and, those are ups. So. And then there's a little ending with the G chord here. And if we were over here, keeping it all in D. back into the song like we did it live when we were doing it live we would go that's how you could get back into it but when we finished the song live we would go and that would be the live ending so like I say it's interesting how things develop you know it started in this started in D but then it got pitch changed up to E flat and then when they went to that riff they went down to C but when we were doing it live it would be in D, it would stay in D, and it had an extra kind of tag chord thing at the end. Okay, so we're going to talk about one more song real quick, and then I'm going to have more James Brown coming up in the future, um, very soon, but let's talk about Sex Machine, that's another fun one. So, same chord, th that's why I call it the James Brown chord, is because a lot of his songs were based on that sound, that's like the funky chord, you know, the kind of happy funky chord. This one, that Hendrix kind of purple haze sort of chord, that one has more grit to it. It's like more of a minor thing. I would say it's more kind of edgy, you know, especially put some fuzz and distortion on that thing. It gets crazy, you know, like a P-Funk type thing. So anyway, we're going to talk about Sex Machine right now. So we have this D7-9 chord, D9 chord, and we're going to go. So that right there, when you put that thing in there, that's the pinky on the seventh fret of the first string. That makes it a 13 chord. Now it's a D7913, but for short, you just call it a 13. My first night with James Brown, he came up to me and he said this, play that, son, play that. And I didn't know what he was talking about. What is that, an A, an E? Uh, I mean, had no idea. All he meant was, that's a 1 and a 3. He meant, put the 13 chord thing on that. So all that, mean, all that meant was just put that pinky down. You got that different sounding funk chord now. Just has a little different ring to it. And it can be used in a lot of funk settings, and he used it. I'm going to show you how he used it in Sex Machine right here. So we got. So that is the first part of Sex Machine. And sometimes we would play that, it seemed like, nine, ten minutes of just that, you know. And if you notice... You got this chicky chick thing going on. It's like it's steady, and that's how you keep everything in place. Doesn't matter where the chord is. You just get used to having that steady feel, and you just pop those chords. You make this these hand these fingers go in when you want it, and you know stopping the pressure when you don't want it. So you can keep that chickity chicky thing going. So here we go. You guys want to try that with me? Let's check it out. Two, three, and.
Now here goes the bridge. We're gonna go up to the four chord, which is five frets above where we were. So that's the 10th fret. 10, nine, 10, 10, 10. So that's the G7, nine, or the G9. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna start with the 13 chord. We're gonna go. We're gonna pull it out for those last two. So, dun -dun, dun -dun, and then we're gonna go. And so that was just the same chords on the eighth, ninth, and 10th fret. Now, to keep it all in time with the stroking up and down, those are upstrokes. But what James Brown liked is he told us you got to play down. So he would like the attack to come from above sometimes on those things. So it'd be like. So sometimes things are moving too fast. We couldn't always do that. But he could kind of hear the difference and he would want you to play down. He would say, son, you're playing up. I want you to play down. So that would always be kind of a challenging thing. So where they really go is their upstrokes. But if he wanted you to do it that other way, you'd have to go. You know what I'm saying? So that, that'd be the playing down thing. And I think that came from stuff like... Like a try me type of a doo-wop thing. I think if you were to do that like this. With the down up thing, I think it has a different ring to it. It might sound great to everybody, but you know, like he kind of felt like, I believe he felt like that when you attack from the lower notes of the chord, it has a different ring to it. And it does than if you hit from the bottom first. So he would like to be like, And I think he felt like you could control the you could control the attack and the sound of the chords better and make them sound more kind of uniform probably as opposed to when I go down up I have two slightly different sounding chords even though it's the same chord it's because of the attack where the pick came from so that's kind of why he would have us try to do some of that kind of down picking stuff that would have been the ups like when I play it now in my band that's, I do the ups it makes it easier he's not there to say play down you know but this would be the other way. So it's up to you which way you want to try it. But anyway, that's been a little bit of James Brown. And once again, I'm Damon Wood, and I played with James Brown for eight years. Played Royal Albert Hall, played Bonnaroo, played um, Glastonbury Fest, played the Hollywood Bowl. Um, played with Michael Jackson, played with Elton John. Uh, we had Slash on stage with us one night. So anyway, it was a great time, and thank you again, James Brown. He was the baddest, baddest cat I ever saw. Hey, folks, we're going to do a couple James Brown songs today. We're going to start out with one called Soul Power. So Soul Power goes like this. Okay, so that's basically soul power. Let's check it out. So we got a D raise nine. Now this chord was added to the live show. So it, um, I think in the studio recording, it kind of waits on that downbeat and comes in with this other part. But we're going to play that in there. You can you could take it out or leave it in, whichever you like. So this is a D raise nine. It's going to be five, four, five, and six. So we hit that on the downbeat, and then we're going to have this chord. This is part of a D minor top. So that's seven, six, and five. What we're going to do is we're going to go... So we will have an upbeat on that second chord. That second chord puts that pinky in there on the seventh fret. So it's, then we go to the eight. So we're going seven, six, five to seven, six, seven to seven, six, eight. So we got. So that one went from like the eight twice to the seven to the five back to the seven. So.
So if you notice, and this goes back to that whole like 16th notes thing where you're basically, you always have that kind of down and up stroke going. It's just which ones are muted, which ones are you really sounding out. And so if you notice the second chord here, the one that has the seven, that's going to be an up stroke actually. And then most of them are downs, but there's going to be a couple ups in there. So. So that, that one with the five down there was up also. Up. Up. And if you wanted to play without that chord, it'd just be two, three, four, one. One. Okay, and so these chords, this is a D minor, like I said. This is a D minor six. This is a D minor seven. Okay, so that's our first part. Let's try to play that together, I'll count you in. Kind of slow tempo. Two, three, four. Okay, so that happens a lot of times, and then we're going to go up here to this G7-9 chord. This is going to be 10, 9, and then you get that ring finger, getting those 10s. So that was a big part of the James Brown sound. These two chords, especially this D raise 9, but even more so this 7-9 chord. So here we're going to have, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's going to be 10th fret of the G string. And then we're going to the D string, 12, 10, 12. three times of that, then the fourth time is going to end a little different. So that was bump. Then we're going to bend this 12. This new thing, we're gonna do a C7 here. This is the eighth fret. Eight, 10, eight, nine, eight, eight. C7. We're gonna go one. And so we don't hit on the one, we kind of hit a chick there on the one we hit after that. So it's like, we got a little run. So that was 10 on the A string. And then eight, 10, 10 here. And then back to this 10. This time we go up to that 12, so that ends up being 10, 8, 10, 12. And then the end of it is, so that's 10 on the A, to 10 on the E, 8 on the A, back to this D note here on the 10th fret of the E string. So. Now instead of hitting that last D, what I would do is I'd go back and hit that D raise 9 chord. So there's a lot of muting going on. There's um, my palm is muting the big strings, and I'm stro I'm stroking. I'm trying to hit with the pick down here on these lower strings all the time too. And also this uh, finger here is muting that D string so that you're able to do all this chanking away and not hit any unwanted open strings, you know, so pay attention to the muting for sure. I'll go to G. Now at the 
end of the song, we're going to have this little tag at the end. So a lot of, at the end of a lot of his songs, we would do a lot of this. Uh... Sometimes we get real quiet with it. Sometimes we get louder with it. But it was always to like stretch out that space while he was entertaining the audience, trying to figure out where he wanted to go next or leading up to like to hit some final beat or something, depending on the song. Let's look at that last C7 going out again. So that's your D7-9 with that ring finger doing those fives on the bottom. And then end on a D raise nine. Which raise nine also means uh, dominant seven sharp nine. So that has more of a... I call it like a, um, kind of like a Jimi Hendrix Purple Haze kind of a chord, more than like a I feel good. This one's kind of happier, this one kind of has more of an edge, darker edge to it. Now doing it to death has a little riff that starts out. And that begins the main rhythm. So let's look at that opening riff again. So we got five, seven on the D string down to seven on the G, and then we're gonna go. So that last part was seven to five on the G, seven on the D, back to the five on the G, and then five, three on the D. So, so we put them together and we got. And then we're gonna do a C9 to a D9 twice. Okay, so once again we got. We're gonna have a walk up chromatic from the three. And when I say three, I mean the bass note. That's the C bass note. So we do have a two here, but I'm really calling it a three because that's where we're kinda we're kinda leading with that bass note. So three, four, five, six, seven. And that's where we begin this new riff. So let's go through that all one more time. Okay, now this is going to begin our new thing off this F9. So that was just the same chord up one, and then we come back, and then we do the raise nine here. So. And that's your verse. Going to have a funky good time. So it does that a whole bunch of times. Then in the live show, as it developed over the years, I guess he had added in these chords, because we always did these whenever I was in the band. We would come up to the G9 here, and this part is not on the original record. So we have the G9 to a C13. And a C13 is kind of like a C7, but it instead of having these two notes and that 8th fret 2nd string, you have a 10th fret 2nd string. And that's the 13th note of the scale, that's why it's called that. So it's really like a C7 with a 13 added to it. So we got the G9, which is a G7 9. C13. It's just kind of um, inferred, it's kind of just known that these things are basically 7s and 7-9s seven sometimes. But what you'll do to be able to communicate it quicker to people is just give that number. And they kind of know, if you're doing a funk song, they know it's not a major 7 or 9 or 13. They know what you're talking about. They know it's like this already dominant seven type chord with a certain number added to it, you know. So one more time from the F. Now I'll do the G to C. Back to F. And then after you do that for a while, you do a couple verses of that, then he would start talking about going to D. Dog D, down D, funky D. And that's we just we're gonna transfer the key, switch keys there and just come down to this fifth fret D one. So that's how that one goes. A lot of times I would get a solo in the show 
if I didn't mention in this video, I played with James Brown for eight years. So this was one of my, these are two of my favorite songs that we got to play in the show. And uh, a lot of times when we went to the key of D, that's when I would get a solo mm -hmm. and he would say, uh, you know, Damon, funky D, get down, whatever. And um, so what I would use is I would use the D Dorian mode. So if you want to look up here, the D minor pentatonic is a good place to start for it. That's your basic blues scale. Then you could add your flat fifth in there by going. And of course, it's good to know the positions all up and down the neck for that so that you could move up and down at will and kind of go with where your improvisational instincts are taking you. But if we look at this Dorian mode, you got 10, 12, 13, 10, 12, 9, 10, 12, twice, 10, 12, 13, twice. So that was the scale that I would use a lot to try to get kind of jazzy and kind of try to take that sort of one chord thing and make, make it interesting by playing off different so this would be like that other position so if you got This note was part of the flat fifth in that position, so. So stuff like that is what I would do for my solo. But anyway, we're gonna get back into, um, we got the D thing. Now at some point there, there, he would call for some hits, and it would be um, this riff here. This is going to be like the 8, 9 to 10, then we go down to the 1. When you do the 1, you got to have an open string in there, so you just kind of pull this finger out of the way, and then you can put it back in. So that was 1, 2, 3, B flat, B, and C9. So we got F, F sharp, G, and you can call this like a B flat, B, C, and then we're going to go E flat. E and F. So all together B. So then at the end of that, you can hit that F9 and try to really hold the, that ring finger down so you can really hear all those different frets kind of going out of there. So the little ending was something like kind of a six, seven, eight, few times. Can't remember if it was two or three times. Now this chord here is another way of doing the C9. This is an interesting one. My buddy Keith in the band, he taught me this one for the first time. This is a different way of doing that nine. It, as if your bass note was on the big string, then you end up with a eight, muted A string, and then eight, seven, eight. So the middle of it there looks like it's like kind of like looks like that eight seven eight, but it's got it's a tricky one to get all those fingers in there, but this would be like a F to that C, and then there'd be a little riff that he would play at the end, and that's just eight to ten on the G string, so it's, and then we'd all hit together, and that would be the end of the song. Okay, so hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, Soul Power and Doing It to Death by James Brown. Please like and subscribe, and we shall see you soon. Thanks a lot.